Hi chess fans, welcome to another game. Today um, I wanted to look at a game between uh, Bobby Fischer with white and Taimanov with black. This is from the um, quarterfinals in the 1970s where in a match of six games Bobby Fischer beat Taimanov 6-0 and Taimanov famously after this game said he's never going to play chess again. Uh, Bobby Fischer of course then went on to become world champion qualifying for the um, match against uh, uh, Spassky and this is the uh, sixth game uh, of this match so um, it's already 5-0 for Bobby Fischer and um, so very interesting setting let's have a look at the game Bobby Fischer played um, e4 Taiwanov replied c5 knight f3 knight c6 d4 takes takes e6 knight b5 um, d6, bishop f4, e5, bishop e3, knight f6, bishop g5. Believe it or not, this bishop jumps, um, constantly re-evaluating what is the best position for the bishop is actually theory, as I learned myself as well. Bishop e6, knight c3, a6, takes, takes. Um, this is all um, actually uh, today considered better for black but it's an okay position normal position so to speak knight a3 knight d4 knight c4 f5 e takes knight takes bishop d3 rook c8 bishop takes rook takes bishop takes f takes and e2 so um a lot of these exchanges here in the center could have been played in a different way and it would have been a bit different game but essentially um nothing there was no bl big big blunder and so now we have this position on the board and um so this is interesting now uh, i think this is a critical middle game position and so uh, the engine say this is about equal and um question to you um, what are the major imbalances in this position and um, based on these imbalances how should both sides uh, play what plan should they have in this game. So let's have a look. First of all, pawns. Uh, black has three pawn chains and white only has two. So, um, and white's pawns are still flexible, they can adapt. So, overall, this is favoring white. On the other hand, black's pawn are nice here in the center and they are controlling the center which means um, the moment that these pawns move forward, they can protect each other and kind of push white towards the other side of the board, providing more mobility to black's pieces, giving black an advantage if these pawns can move forward. Also controlling the center means that white has a little bit of a difficult time coordinating his pieces. Um, because of these three pawn chains, um, Black's king is stuck in the middle, where it is uh, because the queens are still on the board and the rooks are still on the board, uh, where it might be susceptible to attacks by white. Also, um, white's queen is a good piece to attack, for example, this pawn at the same time as this pawn, or so one of these pawns. It's a good piece to attack two pawns at the same time. But again, these pawns here in the middle are a major, major asset for black. So basically, black's plan is very simple, activate the pieces um, and push these pawns forward and create pressure. And White's plan is to kind of like weaken these pawns, try to stop them from advancing and maybe then attack some weaknesses and take advantage of the fact that the king is in the middle. So very interesting position. Let's have a look how Taimanov chose to deal with this position. Okay, first he centralized the rook. This might potentially support some of these pushes here and also the rook was of course attacked by the queen white castles short so maybe black also wanted to stop bobby fisher from castling long side queen to g5 activating the pieces rook a d1 okay so bringing the pieces in creating some pressure on these pawns centralizing uh, the rook also if this rook was exchanged um, as we will also see in the game, this pawn has to move forward and there might be some weaknesses. So let's have a look in this position here. What should white reply here positionally? Okay. So 
the one thing that uh, what how should black respond of course how should, one thing black can always do is to play rook g8 threatening a mate and then white can play uh, g3 for example to stop this um, but what about exchanging the rook here what do you think of this move for example if white takes is this good or bad for black well exchanging the rook like this is actually good for black because now black can push these pawns forward, open up the diagonal for the uh, bishop and also um, this pawn here is protected, the knight gets some uh, some central squares are taken away from the knight, the knight cannot move here, the knight cannot move here also this rook is blocking the knight to go back to the position, also the queen so this is actually bad, making the knight worse and making the bishop better and it's advancing the pawns okay, so this is why um, if black exchanges the rook and white takes back, that is actually giving black a little advantage here. At least black is able to follow his plan. What if after this exchange, again this didn't happen, you can see the, the Tamanov played the queen here. If the queen takes, what do you think about this position? It's basically the same thing. Black can throw in a mate threat here, g3 d5 is, is the same thing. Worse knight, worth, worse knight better bishop, um, and the pawns are moving, and even in this position compared to the one before, the queen is a little worse because it's less centralized. And also, black has the additional resource of marching this pawn forward, because this pawn here is pinned. But, um, um, white can also take with the knight. Okay, this looks a little strange. The knight goes back, but why is this actually helping white? It's helping white because it prepares to play c4, fixing this as a weakness. And let's have a look if, for example, black threatens a mate here, we play g3 and then activates the rook. c4 followed by, let's say, h5. Black is following this plan against the king here. Knight to c3, h4, knight to e4. You can see that the knight has this nice square here. In this case, it even goes there with tempo. But um, attacking the pawn and then this is a good weakness and it's fixed by this c4 because it can be attacked by all pieces. It can be attacked by the knight, the queen and the rook. This is why this is a real weakness. And um, by exchanging the rook, Black allows white to retake with the knight, which basically helps, um, which helps um, white with his plans in this case. What happens if we just advance this pawn, where we can still play c4? Because after takes, takes, these pawns are super weak. And if the pawn advances, queen e4, the the queen reigns supreme, putting pressure on this pawn, on this pawn, and also on the king, so this square cannot be taken away to the queen. So that's why advancing the pawn in this case is also not helping much. So these are the type of things that are critical in this position. Um, I really think it's a critical position here, should black exchange or not, and basically you can see all of the considerations and the different variations center around the fact, is it good or bad? if these pawns advance. And so this is really what this position is all about. Okay, black played for these reasons uh, queen to f5, but this allows black to take and um, uh, white to take. And black, of course, has to retake with the pawn, which is good for several reasons. First of all, it opens up this pin. It introduces this idea that this pawn is pinned on the king. It also, of course, attacks this pawn. and. Um, it also makes this pawn here on d4 a little weak because it's it's advanced but not protected. So the game continued knight to e4, where it has ideas to both pressure this pawn and jump back to attack the queen. And let's have a look at some variations. After e5, why not? Because it's protecting these pawns. Um, white can actually uh, lever up the pawns. For example, after rook d1, king d7, c3. We are just levering up the pawns. If black doesn't play king d7, but for example just puts the rook on a white square, we can already take. 
because of this pin and the double attack on the king and the queen. And um, let's just look at another variation to illustrate after d5. I mean, after all, why not? Attacking the knight. Here we see the idea that the knight can jump back to g3, queen has to move, and then we can again play this lever here, because after takes, takes, black cannot take with the queen because of this check. And after any other move, for example, bishop c4, if bishop c5, we can play, can throw in this knight, and uh, this is a nice idea because we play g3, stabilizing this line, and then the knight can attack this weakness here and is protected here. Um, after throwing this in, we have to move c4 again, levering up. And uh, if the pawn advances in a variation like this, again, we have the problem that we can activate the queen. So you can see all of these are scenarios when it's bad to advance the pawns. Okay, um, so that's why um, Black said, okay, let's leave the pawn where it is. Um, let's just develop pieces, bishop e7. Game continued, rook b1, attacking this pawn. And again, after e5, we have this tactical blow because of the pin. So um, black actually chose to defend the pawn with the queen. I mean, if he goes with the bishop, um, we win immediately after uh, we win immediately after um, this um, this fork here again. Okay. I mean, even this is better for white um, because the queen again gets active double attack on this, also threatening to come in here, so um, white is taking advantage of these resources in the position. Um, so rook d1, uh, black decides to defend with the queen, but then we just put more pressure, and the pawn falls. And after um, this exchange, uh, white is up with pawn, and the rest is actually technique. Okay, so um, after kind of like the opening, um, I think we see a very good, um, a very good example of how white can play against a, a pawn center like this. How white can neutralize a pawn center like this. It would actually be interesting to look at how black can play, but I guess um, black should just activate his pieces quicker and then um, bring the king to a relatively safe square and then find ways to advance these pawns in a way that um, it doesn't open up weaknesses and it doesn't allow white to attack the advanced pawns. And maybe from this perspective it would have been even better to move this rook here to an active square. I mean, even here it's at least attacking the pawns if this pawn advances I can maybe play this bishop here and I already have some pressure on this file, so I get to advance this pawn for free. I mean, after after this, I can already play e4. Attacking this, so if I'm protecting, then, I don't know, I can play um, maybe even protecting this pawn here. Okay, so already my pawns are a little more advanced, my rook looks a bit more active, my bishop looks a bit more active. So I think it's really for black, it's really about um, creating threats, playing active and moving these pawns forward as he goes. And maybe this move here could be criticized because it's not really doing this. Maybe the plan of like protecting this square and this square to advance the pawns is just a little too slow because this rook can also be attacked in the meantime. Good, so let's just have a look at some Fischer technique after this pawn was won in this game where Fischer was up 5-0. Uh, knight drops back, rook drops back, so um, white is just consolidating very often after we win material. It's about consolidation in the first step. And then just moving pawns forward, protecting weaknesses, activating the king, slow steps, finding a good square for the knight again. Any exchange is good for white, so something like this um, is, of course, good for white, this is a one pawn ending, the king just marches over here and then these pawns have a majority against this pawn, if the king runs over to protect we just beat these pawns. So why is a pawn up in the pawn endgame is usually won very easily. Um, so black doesn't exchange, you know in an endgame like this the white side should not advance their pawns. 
so maybe here in this position a more resilient way would have been to maybe bring this rook out i mean i'm critiquing timon of here one of the strongest player but i mean we want to also learn if we can so maybe um the engine actually gives b5 but the engine also gives c rook c4 which i kind of like a bit more what happens after b3 then we just go to e4 and let's say if after a move like this move the bishop back and just drop the rook back and just hold things together a little bit let white come it's maybe a little bit more better way more resilient way to play against this um anyways so black is is pushing forward pawns and some things get exchanged here so taking advantage of the pin um, pushing the pawn forward and then of course black cannot take here because with two pawns up this is one rook ending um, so check king has to drop back we just expand expand the pawns and then in this position time enough resign and fisher won 6-0 and again um, the really instructive part of the game is here in the middle because the opening is quite standard the ending is quite uh, it's just technical but here it's really um, Fischer is winning the game because he finds a better way to deal with this uh, pawn center and um, I think we can learn a lot from this game on how um, you know the engine shows this is dead equal but then um, the position is actually very unbalanced and whenever there's an unbalanced position the side who has a better understanding of the position finds the better plans and move and wins like for example rook d1 is maybe not such a good plan like maybe rook d1 here is a very good plan and then exchanging this moving the knight over here with the plan you know of maybe later finding a setup like this you know all of these are things that are better plans okay i think uh this is it i hope you learned a lot and had a lot of fun watching it see you around next time bye